10 annual legislative coffee. And uh, we have some breakfast pizza and some dessert pizza back there. There's coffee, water, help yourself to that at any point. Um, our moderators today will be Tom Early and Marlo Hovey. Uh, we're gonna start with an uh, introduction of our legislators, give them a couple minutes to uh, talk, uh, tell, tell them uh, you who they are and what they've been working on in here. And then we'll open it up to questions. If you guys don't engage early, we have a few prepared questions, but um, I'm sure this crowd will be just fine. So at the very end, we'll wrap up and give our legislators uh, a moment to uh, uh, give a short summary uh, and talk about uh, anything they would like to talk about. And, and we'll wrap this up by about 10, 15. All right? And turn the fan well, good morning, and as uh, Dan said, uh, I'm Tom Early with Alliance Club, and Marlon Hovey is the president of our Alliance Club, the largest volunteer organization in the world. Uh, we're in the Alliance Club. I am not in charge of valet parking. Okay, <laughs> all right, just do it. Well, appreciate you being here. There's lots of diverse opinions in the room. I'm sure this morning. More importantly, you're here because you're interested in uh, in the governance of the state. You're interested and you care, and that's important. You're showing up. And that's uh, that's an important thing. So, just having said that, uh, we're going to let our uh, legislators introduce themselves, and we'll start with Senator Chris Langer. How do you want me to do this? Yeah, just hold it. Yeah. Just hold it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you all for being here today. It's great to see. I think so this. Oh, leave it down. Okay. 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 All, right. All right. Sorry about that. All right. It is being taped. Just tell everybody knows that. <laughs> All right. That's the yeah. Behave. Behave. Mr. Mayor, better behave. That's right. Can you stand? We can't see back here. Oh sure. Thank you. Um, Senator Chris Langer. Um, I'm the Senate Majority Le Leader this year, or again in the Senate. So my life is pretty busy. Uh, trying to. I have a 30-member caucus that uh, try to keep under control and decide what bills we hear on the floor every day. So. Uh, definitely keeps my life busy. I live right here in Del Rapids. I have uh, two grown boys, um, my husband and I, and a granddaughter that uh, is two years old. Um, they live out, live out uh, not very, just right across from here. So they're pretty close to me as well. Um, one of the bills that I'm carrying right now that passed out of the Senate State Affairs Committee this week I'm pretty excited about is called Step Therapy Protocol. So I don't know if Unless you've been really sick, you probably don't even aren't even aware that this happens. So insurance companies demand requests from the physician that you start with the cheapest drug <coughs> and you go to the more expensive drugs as they don't work for you. So what's happening, what we've realized though is, so the mayor is on um, t number five medication and all of a sudden he changes insurance companies. Well, those insurance companies, even though number five is working well for, for him, may make, make you go back to number one. So I look at this as a really big consumer protection bill that, that just <coughs> does not mandate the insurance companies to do this. It's permissive language, but it does allow the doctor to say, look, he needs to stay on number five because the clinical trials, it, it's working for him. So it's more of a collaborative agreement between your doctor and yourself rather than the insurance companies. And the cool part about it is, it, is the insurance companies have no data that that's increased premiums or increased costs. So I, I think it is really a good consumer protection bill that, um, like I said, unless you're really sick, you don't even really know that that's how, that that's how things work. Um, so uh, other than that, we've been working hard on the budget. Obviously, you know that um, the governor had 0% across the board for teachers, state employees, and um, providers. providers, CSPs. So we worked, we're working hard to, uh, get different numbers in that and and right now as it looks our appropriators have found our revenues were really good for we didn't have our December numbers in <coughs> we're over Christmas and um, things are very positive so I think I think uh, we'll have some happy people once we leave here at least that's our intent so but thank you so much for being here <coughs> Well, good morning, everybody. My name is John Hansen. I'm from here in Del Rapids. I um, live uh, just south of town with my wife, Sheila, and we've got four kids, eight and under. Uh, so life is crazy and busy and great. Um, uh, I'm a majority whip in the house. That's a leadership position that I've taken on. Um, so th that comes with a lot of added responsibilities. I'm also the chair of the House Judiciary Committee, so we stay really busy 
in House Judiciary. Representative Pischke is on the Judiciary Committee with me as well, so we hear a lot of bills in Judiciary Committee. Um, I, I don't want to duplicate uh, Senator Langer's efforts. Um, it's, it's been a busy year of policy. It's been a really busy year on the budget. Uh, there's a lot going on, so happy to be here and uh, take your questions and have a, have a good conversation. Uh, good morning. My name is Representative Tom Pischke. I also live here in Del Rapids. I'm here with my fiance, Lisa. Uh, between the two of us, we have four children. Uh, I serve on the Judiciary Committee, as Representative Hansen expressed, and I also serve on the Taxation Committee. Um, like I said, uh, there's a, you know, a lot of bills going through the process right now. Um, a lot of bills have died, in fact, too. Um, we do, I, like Senator Langer did say, uh, you know, before the, the governor said that there wouldn't be any increases for the big three. Um, I'm pretty confident at this point from talking to our appropriators that there's going to be money there now that the budget numbers have come in. So, um, like they, they said on that aspect, I think a lot of people are going to be happy as far as, as far as that goes. So. But uh, looking forward to all you guys' questions. So, I, since I'm the mayor, I get to ask the first question. Right. All right. <laughs> uh, we all hear about the term local government, local control, and uh, people's relationship with uh, government is, is at the local level. That's the things that impact us most directly: uh, services, education, law enforcement, property taxes, utilities, park streets, and everything else. People think that we should take care of. Uh, the authority that the city gets comes from the state law, and that's what uh, we, they tell us what we can do in our laws to take care of that. One of the things that uh, had came up last year in the Senate, uh, in, the, in the legislation, and again this year, is a bill, HB 1226, extending the time for referring a resolution or ordinance after publication from 20 days to 40 days. Right now we pass an ordinance, it's 10 days before it even gets to the paper, so that it's actually 30 days. But anyway, uh, the, the big issue is local control. How, what's your philosophy attitude toward local control and things being done at, at the lowest level? Thank you. Obviously, I served on. Oh, I guess, obviously, I served on city council. I was pre I was president at one time of the Del Rapids City Council, so I do believe in local control. I guess that's a house bill, so I'll defer to my house colleagues. I have not not seen that yet, but the mayor has ta has talked to me about it, and I'm not sure the the, the rationale or the reason behind it, um, but. Uh, you know, I, I do believe that once citizens are engaged and, and uh, it's at the local level that, that things are done much better. <coughs> um, once you get out to Pierre, you really learn that we are truly blessed here in this, this part of the, the state. Um, and we, you know, not that we don't have our own problems, but they're very different from West River or even just a few miles down the road. So that's where the local control does really come in. Um, the people that live in the area do know best of in my opinion, what's going on and how things should be done. We do things a lot different here, say in Del Rapids, than they do in Eagle Butte. One of my senators is from Eagle Butte, and the stories that he has, I feel like he lives in a truly different world. You know, it's a, he, t he talks about their teachers and uh, how they have to have a washing machine and showers for their kids when they come in because there's so many students that don't have running water. So they come in and they wash their clothes and they shower them so that they can come and be productive um, students in their in their day. So that's a vastly different <coughs> problem than what we have, um, say in Del Rapids. Not saying that some of that doesn't happen, but uh, so yeah. Long answer to your question. I yeah, I do believe in local control. Yeah. So local control starts to look different depending on the issue that's presenting itself. But I mean, big picture. Uh, I've always been a proponent of local control. I think it's important that our cities and our counties have the ability to govern themselves according to what they know best just by being closer to the problems that are present on, in that particular day. Um, yeah, I also think that local control um, is more than just small governmental subdivisions. And uh, when we think about local control, we should also think about the, the, um, the private property owner's rights. Because the purest form of local control, I think, is allowing a private property owner to do whatever he or she wants with his or her own property. Um, that looks like local control to me. So I always keep that in mind as well when we're considering questions of local control. Sometimes that comes up as well. As far as the, um, the time frame uh, to gather signatures to refer uh, a measure, 
like the mayor was talking about. I haven't looked at this bill in particular yet, but my concern would be, and I do, I do just want to make sure that when citizens want to refer <coughs> something that's been passed, that they have adequate time to do so, that it's fair. And so I, I don't know if 20 days right now is the right amount. I don't know if 40 days is the right amount, but this just involves sort of a, a striking of that balance between allowing cities to get their business done while at the same time making sure that citizens have the right to have their say as well in the petitioning process. So I'll take a look at it. Um, 20 days seems a little short, depending on the amount of signatures that are required. I know it's not a ton, but 20 days does strike me as a little bit narrow. Maybe 40 days is too long. So you know we'll have those conversations and try to strike the right balance. Thank you. Yeah, I'm also a big proponent of local control, uh, kind of saying what uh, Representative Hansen said, but I also believe in the, the smallest form of local control is the liberties of the individual. And so depending on the issue, if there's something that can just go down to the individual, that's the smallest form of local control in my opinion. Looking at this bill that was brought up, I had never, I had not seen this bill yet this year, but it looks like it was brought by Julie Freimuller, who's a representative out in Rapid City. And I do know that the Rapid City has had some issues with not being able to get enough signatures on their petitions for, a, for the referendums on, on some of their uh, municipality issues. So I think that's probably the reason for the, for the, the bill. And um, you know, it's, it's probably worth the discussion, so. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna turn it open to uh, questions from you guys and uh, we'll run around with this mic just to make sure that you get uh, recorded on the tape. So who, who wants to go first? Let's Tom's see. got one there. Yeah, one in the back, yeah, we'll just, okay. We're gonna get our aerobic exercise today. <laughs> just to follow up to Mayor Early's uh, local control, you all said you were proponents to local control. In what cases could you see taking away local control? Well, there's a, there was a bill that was up on the House floor on Thursday. I honestly missed the vote. I was, I was invited to go, um, to, go to the, our new bishop's ordination in Sioux Falls, so I, I attended that. I, that's probably the, it might be the first day of session I haven't missed, but anyway, um, so the bill lost. It's up for reconsideration, so I'll vote on it next week. But the bill would have banned, uh, it would have prohibited local municipalities from passing prohibitions on plastic bags or plastic straws, things of that nature. So that's one of those where I start thinking about what true local control looks like. And I think about, well, in this case, true local control, to me, looks like a grocery store being able to use whatever product it wants to serve its customers. And so that's where, that's one of those situations where you could make the argument that this is a local control issue because the city should be able to prohibit that if they want to. But then on the other hand, I go to what I think is an even purer form of local control, which is just allowing uh, that grocery store, for instance, to be able to use whatever bag that they want to use. Does that answer your question? One example. Well, and I'll add on to that just a little bit. That did come through the Senate. What, what interestingly came out of that discussion was we had a couple different manufacturers reach out to us and sent us samples of boxes, bags, straws, several different items that they're making right now that if, if uh, say, the city of Sioux Falls doesn't allow them, they are plastic bags and straws that literally, when they decompose, I mean, they had, they had a crazy short number, but they turn into calcium dust. They're like made out of some really interesting product where they actually just decompose very quickly. And uh, so if there was truly a ban on those items, their companies wouldn't be able to sell to South Dakota. So there's another, I mean, it's just interesting the things that you learn when, um, when, when stories like that come up. If I can just answer the question too. So I also, I was there for that vote on Thursday and I did vote for that ban, even though the bill failed, but it's gonna be reconsidered. But, but I do consider that the local control in that situation should be the business owners. They should be able to decide if they want to ban plastics or not in their store. Another example that we, a bill we had was earlier this week uh, was a idea that the county commissioners could approve a t half, pen, half cent sales tax for the county. Uh, the idea was that it could, they get enough signatures, they get it put it on the ballot, it go to the, the vote of the people, and then the county could add a half cent sales tax just for their county sales. 
Um, I voted against the bill. Uh, I thought, felt that there were some problems with it. Um, but it is, in the, in the grand scheme of things, it is a local control because the people of the county do, do get to decide. If, we, if that were to pass, you, you would have counties that say, Brookings were to pass it and have a half cent sales tax, and the Coddington would not, people traveling down the interstate could possibly know that, hey, I can buy the same product cheaper than one county as opposed to the next, and that would hurt certain counties in that aspect. So, um, how, other how, problems I had with the, what? How is it going to hurt? Because the same product would be more expensive in one county rather than the other. Isn't that their decision? The, the county's decision? They're sure they're aware of that. True. So, other problems I found with the legislation is that there was no maximum length that they would have to the tax on those those projects. Uh, there was no cooling off period. They, were, they could go stack projects over each other. So, I, that was kind of some of my reasons for against the bill. Next question, right here. Thank you. Um, Representative Hansen, you had just mentioned when talking about HB 1226, the importance of citizens having their say in the petitioning process. However, your 2019 HB 1094 to control the petition process was found unconstitutional and cost South Dakota taxpayers over $112,000 in legal fees. Um, I see this year you also uh, are a sponsor on SB 180, which also has to do with petitioning. So when do you believe citizens ha should have their say in the petitioning process, and when do you want to take it away? Well, uh, thanks for the question. Um, I don't know, I I've not seen those numbers in legal, fee legal fees. By the way, so there was, a, there was a bill that was passed last year um, that dealt with petition and referendum process and the gathering of those signatures. That bill was litigated in federal court. The, there was a judge in Aberdeen that decided against the case, uh, against the state. The state has since appealed that ruling, so now that's going up to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, uh, the, the reason that bill was passed in the first place is because, rewinding back even further, there were a number of measures that were being placed on the ballot, which is fine. Uh, we have the right to do so in South Dakota. It's an important right that we should maintain. Um, but what I experienced in, um, in my legal work on some of these issues is that we had a number of people coming in from out of state and circulating these petitions in violation of South Dakota law. Because South Dakota law says that you have to be a resident of the state of South Dakota if you want to participate in our direct democracy process and get signatures to put a law on the ballot. And so basically what, what the old bill did um, for, for paid circulators and for volunteers was to just say there's a lot of information when you turn in your petition that you have to submit via affidavit. That, that was the old law and now it's, it's actually still the law today. This gets a little confusing because it's kind of wrapped up in this litigation but when you circulate a petition for a ballot measure um, you also have to when you submit that petition submit a bunch of information your address, your your phone number, your even, even things like your library card or your hunting license, all of those things. So we said, <clears throat> why don't we why don't we eliminate that and move that to the front end? And so what we did is we set up sort of a, a badging process so that when you when you get your petition, you just tell the Secretary of State some basic information like your address, your name to show that you are actually a South Dakota resident. And the idea here is that we just want to make sure that people can exercise their right to petition in all cases. But those that are circulating those petitions, we want to just make sure that they're South Dakota residents. So that's what the bill, that's what the bill did. Um, now it's being appealed to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. And there's a little bit of an amendment uh, to the bill that's coming through the legislative process now. That amendment would take out um, take out the volunteers. So now we're only talking about people who are being paid to circulate these petitions. So if you're being paid to circulate these petitions, then we're going to ask that you just submit some basic information up front to show that you're a South Dakota resident, and and uh, then you're free to circulate. I have a question about that. What is the difference? Then, for instance, I have a friend that's a Republican. 
and she was involved some years ago in in a petition, but the language and everything came from the federal uh, Republican Party, and she was just <clears throat> the South Dakota advocate, and I don't think there was any question about that, and can't that still happen? Oh, I mean, it seems like the whole purpose is defeated from what you're saying. So you're saying the language of the measure came from some federal source, but otherwise it was being circulated by Not South Dakota. federal. That was a mistake. The Republics, the the National Republican Party, and it was oh. the same language submitted in several other states. So isn't this kind of a, a useless thing? You can get around it anyway. Well, there have been there's been other conversations about um, you know keeping keeping outside money from coming into these things, keeping outside voices from coming into these, um, these ballot measure processes. Um, the, reality, the reality is all of that has been found unconstitutional. So, you know, we welcome, we welcome outside voices. We welcome outside information, that's fine. Uh, but when it comes to those people who are actually physically participating in our direct democracy process by circulating petitions to change our laws, we just want to make sure that they're South Dakota residents. So what you're saying big picture is residents are only allowed to petition. Outside money can come from anywhere. That's right. I mean, under okay. yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. And that's, and that's constitutional. That's constitutional. Sure. There was a measure. There was a measure on the ballot that tried to prohibit is, um, is federal money from constitutional and right and appropriate. Oh sure, absolutely. Yeah, there's a distinction there. Yeah, there was a lawsuit against a, a ballot measure that was passed. I voted against it. Other, you know, enough South Dakotans voted for it that it became law that prohibited outside money from coming in to influence these questions. That law was struck down as clearly unconstitutional. Next question. Let's talk. Pardon me. Okay. <laughs> Tom. Yes. Anti vaccination. I want to understand it and especially how that initiative is not a threat to public health. <clears throat> Okay, well, I don't look at it as anti-vaccination. I look at it as medical freedom, right? I think that the individual should have the right to uh, make a decision as to when they can get vaccinations into their body. I don't think that we should have government control over um, when we put vaccinations in our body. So that's at the simplest form of it. Should I have the right to drive drunk? The, the right drunk. to drive drunk? Yeah, it's the same thing. It's a public health issue. <coughs> well, I, I don't really see that as apples to apples. <laughs> well, so, <coughs> I, I, I want to go back to this, whether it's the straw or this issue, right? I get a feeling that you guys all come from a place of your primary, how you address an issue comes from a place of people have the right before anything else. Like, let's say there's a spectrum, right? You start every, you look at every issue in the middle. The right wing, or this side says that, um, personal preference and what the individual's rights are most important. This side says the government has the right to tell you what to do, right? Can we agree there's a spectrum there, right? Sure. So is it problematic to start every discussion being over here and saying whether it's a business, which now are entities that have all the rights of people, to make decisions what's good for them but not as a whole, same as a person who we don't know what their motives and their information stream is coming from. At what point does a centralized entity have to take the responsibility for the greater good in these circumstances? Whether it's the resources to put in science and research, right? Because a lot of people, you start following the anti-vax, right? And that's what it comes from, right? How many people are getting their information from <laughs> Facebook or or? non-legitimate sites and they don't know how to process so much information out there because you can jump on the internet and find any kind of group that's going to feed your own thoughts whether they're right or wrong right so at what point does 
hey, somebody has to step in and take the responsibility for disseminating the right information and making the right decisions for the greater good. Yeah, we should have the government just tell everybody what to think. That'd be way no, 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 no. That, but that's what I'm saying. There's a spectrum, right? And I'm not saying you jump. You, can, you, have, to, you have to approach everything from a neutral spot, mm. right? Certain things, absolutely, there is no entity you have. That, that's a reason for having, having a government, right? Like, if everybody was, if everybody was saying, hey, your roads in front of your house are your responsibility, I mean, that's, a, that's not a good thing. We need certain things, right? I'm, I'm just saying as a whole, I'm not applying it to, but these are all central to a lot of these issues, right? Is it problematic to, or to start and come at things from a point of, you know, hey, individuals, what they want to do is the most important thing. Well, I mean, and you're absolutely right. I mean, everybody has their different ideology on how government, the role of government in their lives, right? So, um, you know, some people have more of a, a centralist view that the government should be more involved in their lives, and some people value the, the, the freedom of the individual. So, in, in peer, you'll find Republicans and Democrats all over on that spectrum, and on different issues as well. So, I mean, that's, that's just how it is. I mean, everybody has a different idea of how government, how government plays a role in our lives. So, over here. Do you have a question first? I just have I a little follow up. Yeah, I, for Tom. Sure. Um, so, from school board perspective, we require vaccination of students for safety and health of our students. If we have a parent or a child who, for religious reasons, medical reasons, chooses not to do that, end of story. Mm -hmm. We don't say you can't come to school. Right. That that is loud. So to go to the f total opposite end of that spectrum um, is troubling. When we have, you know, in, in three buildings in Del Rapids, 975 students that interact cl on a close basis on a day to day. Uh, a perfect example right now: we have international health emergency with coronavirus. No, not that there's a vaccine for that right now, <laughs> but over the last 10 years, you see increases in measles, mom. I mean these other diseases that were basically done in the, I should say the civilized, I don't say civilized, developed nations. Um, now it's making it a resurgence. So at some point we have to, I mean, I think public policy would be to, we have to balance that need instead of just going, oh, individual, individual, individual. Um, because there's still opportunities for that individual's rights to be protected as they are today in, in current policy and law. Right, so if I understand the current policy that we have, basically we're saying that you have to vaccinate your kids unless you don't want to. Sign this religious form, and they don't have to. So really, what is the difference between what that is and what this proposed change would be? <coughs> Instead of just signing this fictitious law, this, 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 this form, because you don't want to, let's just say, let's, ha let's give these people the freedom. That's really the difference. If, if, we're, if, we're, if, we're, if we're saying there's no difference between what is currently in place and what this bill is being proposed, then why are we proposing this bill in the first place? Yeah. You. you could make the same argument, then why, why is the current law in place? Right? Is, is this being pushed by out of state interests again? No, there is there's a, a gal. There's there are lots of people in the state of South Dakota. There's people in this room who are in favor of this proposed law change. Absolutely, right. So I'll just give a little other spin on it. I am not. I will not support the bill. Um, one of the reasons is that at, um, I met with the USC Medical School, and they said they'd probably lose their accreditation as a as a school. So I think it's a much bigger issue. I think that the bill is really trying to address not just K through 12, so uh, this is my just my interpretation. So K through 12, you can do that form. I think what the, what <coughs> the creators of the bill are also concerned with is employer-employee relationships. So certain jobs that you have, you're required to be vaccinated to work in that field. Now, my personal belief is you should be required to, but I think that's kind of part of the reason why they brought it is because there are people that are um, their jobs are in jeopardy unless they are vaccinated. So it's, it's just kind of a philosophical debate on whether you think that that's appropriate or not. So, but I'm, 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 uh, I won't 
be supporting it. I mean, I, I, I can see both sides of it, but I think our public health is, is very important. Go ahead. You're, spe you're talking about a job. And for instance, I was a volunteer to rock babies. I was at, at the NICU at Sanford. I was required to go through blood tests to make sure all of my antibodies were up for all of those things that I would, had been vaccinated for when I was a child. And I had to have one booster, and I had to have a flu shot, or goodbye, we'll see you at the end of the flu season. So that would mean that then rocking babies, those in the NICU, the little, tiny, very vulnerable children, I wouldn't need to have any of that. Right, and that is a huge concern to me. You know, I, I worked with- That's kind of insane. I worked with children. When I came out of college, I worked with children with developmental disabilities and then went on to work with adults with developmental disabilities. And that really is a concern to me. There are vulnerable people in our society that don't have a choice. They either, for their health reasons or whatever, they cannot be vaccinated. And so when others that are healthy around them are, and, and aren't vaccinated, they run the risk of this child that's healthy might be able to survive the measles, but the child that's already immune compromised will really struggle with it, you know, if, if they contract that disease. So for those reasons, I'll, I, I agree with you. And I'll just, I'll just add, uh, and I appreciate your concern. It's a really good one. It's, I, I agree with your concern. It's a really good one. And, and just fundamentally too, I think, uh, you know, employers have the ability and should have the ability to, to place conditions on their employees. And so if that means the employee has to get a flu shot, or if that means the employee has to wear a hard hat in a work area, or you know, you name the condition, um, employers have freedom to do that. And employees, if they don't want to do that, they can say, no, sorry, I'm just not gonna, not gonna work here. And, and uh, that's, the, that's the balance that's struck today. Um, it lends itself to some harsh results for those employees who, who don't want to get a vaccine and are forced to either wear a mask or quit. But <laughs> I, I just think that um, the bill maybe it, it, it goes too far, especially in the area of, of um, uh, limiting employers and schools' ability to you know, uh, place these conditions on their employees um, to keep people safe. Uh, we have a question over here. I want to stay on the uh, the medical topic. Uh, Representative Hansen, you're the prime sponsor on SB 109, which is an act to provide protections for healthcare decisions governed by conscience. It provides a healthcare provider the right to not participate in any healthcare service that violates the provider's conscience. This would end up opening up South Dakotans to denial of health care based on race, religion, sexual orientation, or other classifications. Explain your sponsor, your, your bill. Thank you um, for that. Well, this is, um, you know, number one, it's a conversation starter. Number two, it really does um, address a growing need um, in the medical community. And, and you see it a little bit, um, especially if you go and you talk to some um, medical students um, down at, at the USD School of Medicine and um, you know they'll, they'll tell you stories and they've got the stories and, and uh, you know they'll tell you stories about how well if you want to do if you want to practice as an OBGYN then um, you just have to prescribe contraception and you just have to be okay with referring people for abortions and um, and uh, and so I have a problem with that and so the, the goal of the bill is just to make sure that, um, that doctors, that nurses, have the ability to practice according to their conscience. And, and, and this allows for that protection to be in place for those doctors and nurses. It doesn't prevent so any if services. My conscience says I don't want to serve you, they're okay with that. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah. If, if there's a procedure, if there's a procedure that you are uncomfortable performing because you you have some religious or you know uh, some sort of objection to it, then you shouldn't. I shouldn't be able to compel you to give me that service. Um, you should be able to say no, and then you can have another doctor or nurse who's comfortable with that step in and perform that service. <coughs> Aren't you, uh, you know, basically if you have a uh, medically proven 
procedure or therapy, and you're telling them that, no, from my, uh, my bias is that I don't want to prescribe it, so I don't have to tell the patient that it exists. That doesn't seem uh, appropriate from a Hippocratic Oath standpoint, that you're supposed to be giving the patient uh, the best care possible and the options that are out there. Yeah, and in those cases, I, I don't disagree with you. And in those cases, the doctor probably shouldn't be practicing in that area. Oh, God. In those cases, they'll lose their license. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, if, if, you're, if, if you're not willing to um, fully disclose, I mean, I, I'm a lawyer. I have an obligation to, um, to, to um, fully inform my clients of all the risks and the obligations associated with whatever's going on. Um, a doctor has that obligation too. Um, but I just think that for, you know, for instance, in the, in the world of OBGYNs, that, um, that doctors should be protected from having to uh, refer their patients out for an abortion. And uh, if they don't want to do that, I, th I think that should be okay and that should be protected. I have another question over here. Uh, this one is on House Bill 1104, which I think uh, Representative Pischke was a sponsor on, so I think I probably direct your, my question at you. Okay. Uh, this has to do with the HIPAA form being uh, required by school districts to participate in activities. And the question that I've had from coaches and administrators in the school district is, what does this mean for when a student athlete gets injured and how do we go from there? Does a trainer qualify as a health care provider? Are we waiting for a parent to confirm that they can pass along their diagnosis uh, to the coach before they can make a decision? Are we allowing the student to say that they're okay, even though they might not be, and risk further injury, especially in the case of maybe a concussion? So like, what are the limitations, or what, what is the purpose, and who is this serving? <laughs> uh, those are all good questions, quite honestly. Um, <coughs> Honestly, I don't have the answers to your questions at this point in time. Um, another House member kind of pitched this to me and asked me to sign on, and I did. Um, she wants to have the discussion about the form. I think, to me, she said something about uh, intrusive um, physical being done by the schools and then not wanting, not wanting that to be done. So that's the, the, the genesis of the legislation. But I, I, do, I really, to be quite honest with you, I need to learn more about the legislation. Do, do we believe that this is an issue in our district? That's another question that I have. Do you think this is something that pertains to District 25? I don't think so. Uh, I'll, I'll just add, because I had a conversation with a, a school principal on this subject. And, uh, you know, the effect of this bill would really be, say, for instance, you're at the football field and you get your team at the football field and maybe a kid gets his head wrong. He goes over to the trainer and uh, the trainer looks at him. The kid comes over and says, coach, put me back in. And the coach says, well, let me talk to the trainer. This would actually prohibit that conversation from happening. From happening. And so... Um, I, I think that's a bad idea. Now, you know, whether the, whether the sponsor um, has issues, and, and maybe there's some, some valid concerns with um, the, the form, I think, as far as I know in general practice, is, is uh, signed by everybody who participates in a high school athletics association activity. And so their concern might be, well, you know, what about like one act play? Do we really need all that information transferred for a kid to go act on stage? But maybe there's justification for that too, you know, and, and, and I'd have to talk to the school to know a little more about that. But certainly when it comes to these athletic events, um, I think the information sharing is very appropriate. And so, you know, for that reason, I, I wouldn't be inclined to support that bill. Thank you. Next question, but uh, don't forget we've got that wonderful uh, Dessert pizza up there, and you, you 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 need to eat it. We can't leave it here, so don't don't uh, hesitate to get a piece and more coffee. Who's got another question? Right here, young lady. Um, I just want to ask, kind of in the same medical um, issues here uh, with surrogacy. Why do you feel? Um, are you more? Uh, leaning towards a ban or regulation because from what I've heard it sounds like it's going to 
be more or less a ban, and then there's going to, after that would possibly pass, be a study done after the fact. Right. So I'm just wondering kind of what the thoughts are with that, why ban versus regulation? If you guys could speak to that, that'd be great. Sure, thanks for the question very much. Uh, that's, I'm, I'm the prime sponsor of that bill uh, on the House side, and the bill would do two, th well, really three things. One, it would prohibit the enforcement of commercial surrogacy contracts. Um, Number two, it would it would prevent businesses from from um, from operating pursuant to those contracts by prohibiting like the advertising for those services, and then it would create the summer study under the bill today, so we could really study the issue. Um, the reason that the bill is being presented to the legislature and the reason why it's a it's a worthy conversation to have um, is because number one, there's many 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 countries that have banned commercialized surrogacy. Um, there's some states that have banned commercialized surrogacy. Um, the concern is, well, there's a number of concerns. Number one, when you look at all of South Dakota law, um, take adoption law, for instance. It's a felony under South Dakota adoption law to pay somebody to give their baby to you up in an adoption. The question is why? Why is that a felony? And the answer is because we have a long-standing policy in South Dakota that we don't want the transacting, the buying and selling of kids. Even if you, even if you look at it in, in context of your own children, you couldn't make a prenuptial agreement today that says, if we ever get divorced, I'll give you the house and the cars, but I get the kids. You can't, that contract is unenforceable. Or even after, say, a divorce situation where there's a custody dispute going on, you couldn't say to um, your former spouse, hey, I'll give you 30 grand if you give me the kids for the year. Why? Why do we say that's not okay? Because we don't want kids to be bartered for commodities. And so um, we always look to, the, to what's in the best interest of the child. But in commercial surrogacy, we get away from that. We don't look at the best interest of the child anymore. Instead, we look at what's in the contract. What's the bargain for commodity? What's the contract say? So to me, and to many other people, it's always most appropriate when considering the custody of a human person to consider what's in the best interest of that child. Not ever to say, well, let's just, let's just read the contract and see where the kid's supposed to go. We would never say that. Um, so that's, that's concern number one. Um, concern number two, and, and we've seen this and we've heard stories, is that when kids become a bargain for commodity in a commercial contract, if the kid that's produced isn't the desired kid that the intended parents want, it tends to become property that can be easily discarded. And so that's why in um, many of these agreements, and we heard from uh, uh, a very nice lady, um, uh, Kelly Martinez is her name. She's from West River. She entered into a South Dakota surrogacy contract, and the contract provided that if uh, if the intended parents did a genetic test on the baby, and the baby said it had like a genetic deficiency, maybe Down syndrome, for instance, the parents could say, "Abort that kid. That's not the kid we bargained for. Abort that kid." And if Kelly says no, that the surrogate mom, Kelly in this case, says no, not only does the contract stop and she receives no more payments under the contract, but she's got to go pay back every cent that she's ever made under that contract. That's what happens when we start to treat kids as property in a contract. So, um, number one, it's, it's incredibly coercive to the mother in that case. That's why human trafficking organizations all over the place, including one in South Dakota, is opposed to commercial surrogacy. Um, and you know, that's why you see right to life organizations um, supporting bans on commercial surrogacy as well, because um, human beings are not property to be discarded if they're not the person that you wanted them to be. Um, so then the, the third and final point I'll just make real briefly is, um, Courts operate pursuant to the law. Courts operate pursuant to the laws that the legislature passes. And the legislature never once authorized 
commercial surrogacy contracts to be upheld in court. But the courts are entering orders based on these commercial surrogacy contracts today. So the courts are unlawfully entering these orders. That's a problem and that should also stop. So um, for those reasons and more, um, that's why the bill is, is um, being considered in the legislature. Um, now, one thing I'll conclude with is what the bill does not do is um, it, it does not mention anything about altruistic surrogacy. So you can think of that in, in terms of just like um, a mother who agrees um, not for profit to carry the child and then just hand it over to the intended parents after the child is born. Um, that's not prohibited. And the adoption code is open to anybody. There's no prohibition in the adoption code that would prevent somebody um, from using those adoption laws in a surrogacy agreement. The adoption code also allows for the uh, for the reimbursement of expenses. So if you want to reimburse the mother for medical expenses, for you know, I've seen cell phone bills, rent, those sorts of things, you could still do that in our adoption laws for the altruistic setting. But when we say, when we look at commercial surrogacy contracts, there are some things that money just can't buy. And, and human children, human beings, uh, is one of those things. So you feel like if someone's uh, getting compensated for it, they're buying and selling children, basically, is what you're trying to say? Um, I, I'm saying that, well, you wouldn't have to take my word on that. I mean, there, there's been many studies. There was a study that was done way back in the 80s on, on commercialized surrogacy um, in New York. New York has banned commercial surrogacy. It's still banned in New York yeah, um, to this to day. Back. That's my worry with if we just go straight to a ban. It's been 30 years and they, you know, they put a ban in effect. And so if we ban it, how, how is that going to be so easy to get back? Because there's not going to be people who have been surrogates or intended parents left to fight for it. Because it's going to be something where there's nobody left to fight for it because it hasn't been around in our state for so long. Sure. So, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question. Um, I just want to do make the point, though, that, that uh, in, in New York back in the 80s, they, they wrote up a comprehensive study on surrogacy to determine whether it should be legal or not in the commercial setting. And that report concluded that commercial surrogacy is indistinguishable from the buying and selling of human persons. So, you know, I, that's, just, that's not just me saying that. That's um, massive studies that have been done. That's human trafficking organizations, things like that. So to your second question, um, again, what we're not trying to do is touch the altruistic side. So, you know, I, I think, um, I, I think if, a, if a couple went to a judge and petition for an adoption in an altruistic surrogacy situation that the judge would grant the order and the surrogacy would be able to take place. So that's why we're, we're, we're not trying to touch the altruistic side, we're just leaving this to the commercialization of it. Have any of you three ever been personally in this situation? Uh, I have not, but I've spoken okay, so with I am people right now, that a have. Family member. We have a family member that we had some trouble getting pregnant and took them, they didn't get pregnant, and she developed breast cancer. They were able to get eight um, embryos, but she doesn't feel that she is capable right now of carrying a child she's still going through. They looked into surrogacy. It is, there's no altruistic person around here, believe me. You know, go ask Sanford about that. I can't see why you can't write a better contract covering those things that you're saying. I mean, you're, one of you is a lawyer, you should know that. But it's a very difficult situation. It's just not so cut and dried as you're trying to make this. And I wish you'd reconsider and not just take the party line on this. Well, I, I don't think there's a party line on this. I think it, I think it goes across all party lines. Um, truly, I mean, if you look at the vote out of the House, it's not a party line thing. Um, and I agree, it's, we're dealing, it's a very difficult conversation to have, it's very emotional. And I, I, uh, I question the motives of nobody, I question the motives of no mother, of no intended parents. I understand the desire to have a child of your own. Um, so so I really, I, I, uh, I, I, can em I can appreciate all of those things. Um, but we do need to look at 
you know, first of all, I, with all due respect, your assertion is not true. I mean, I've spoken with people who use altruistic surrogacy from South Dakota. Can you give me the names of that? I'll pass it along to my relatives. Yeah, well, I, I'm going to protect their, I, I had these conversations in private. I, I would protect their identity um, in that regard. But um, th those people do exist. It's, you know, it's different. It's, it's not the same as organ donation by any stretch. Um, but uh, it is somewhat similar in that in, when it comes to organ donation, you can't go pay somebody to give up their kidney. You just can't. We, we have federal law prohibiting that. Um, but there are many people willing to give up kidneys, and there there are some people willing to be altruistic surrogates um, for for families as well. So you cited one bad example for the surrogacy. Did you talk to more than one? Anybody that had a good experience? I mean, because to 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 do your research properly, you should have talked to more than one person. Yes, I did. So she had a bad one. She's had a great one. And I'm on my second one right now, actually. And so adoption and fostering were not an option in either case. Um, actually, the one I have carried to full term and delivered in April, she just was delivered. Um, it wasn't even biologically their embryo. They had to go to the extremes because they did age out of foster care and adoption at age 50 because they had gone through four rounds of IVF and not realized there was you know that significant of an issue um, until it was unfortunately too late. Um, they had to get an egg donor, sperm donor, and a surrogate. And out of pocket, we maybe made $10,000 between us paying for our insurance that we used to cover their pregnancy and what was reimbursed in the contract. And I did go commercial surrogacy. I did use an agency because I was a first time surrogate. I didn't know how to protect myself, et cetera. So it's not always a big money thing. I mean, $10,000 for over probably a year and a half of medications and pregnancy delivery. Um, recovery, you know, we have children of our own too. We are blessed that way, which is why I felt led to do surrogacy. Um, I don't think it's a big money pot that it's made out to be your buying and selling of children. It's trying to find somebody who's willing to carry your child. And in some cases, they don't just know people that are willing to do that or have fertility to do that. So, sure. And, you know, I've spoken, and I don't I take this with a grain of salt because I don't want to speak out of turn here at all. Um, I, I especially don't want to speak for a commercial surrogate broker. Who, quite frankly, the bill would you know close their business. So, uh, I do want to say though that I I had heard that she had been speaking about the bill. I spoke with her as well, Emily's, and uh, you know her idea was well maybe we can roll our business into a nonprofit so we don't make money off of it, but that we can still um, we can still be there for altruistic surrogates to guide them through that process. So you know that's that would be available. Another question. I kind of have something to go on with that still for the surrogacy oh. aspect. Um, so you're saying that commercial surrogacy is something that you're against and altruistic would be an okay thing? Now, when you go to like an adoption agency and you're paying them all of these fees to essentially go look at an assembly line of children that were just left there that you can pick out the one that you want, and then I know that there are contracts you can do in there where if something comes up where it does not work with your situation like that, you can now give the child back or even with fostering, say you're going to foster someone, bring them in for a little bit, you can get paid to do that, and then say, okay, well now so we found a different family, let's pass that child along. You don't feel like that would be more damaging than going to a set of parents that say, we would like to have a child, we don't have the option to adopt, we're going to go through this extent to line all these things up, make a child, and then in the contract that you can have, you can, you know you can make contracts where, you, you know, if something's going to happen, you're not obligated to just give this child up. You don't need to just go and you can't abort this child. That's all things that can be changed and more regulated. But you're saying that it's okay to pay an adoption agency to find you a child, but you can't go to a surrogacy agency to help get you a child. Well, again, so um, if, if you look at our adoption laws as, as a model for regulation, which I think they really are. I mean, they, they've, been, they've been on the books for decades and decades. And the adoption laws make clear that you cannot well, they, they, they make it a felony um, to receive compensation in exchange for a human person. And I think that makes sense. So where's the money go that you pay to an adoption agency to get to Somebody's acquire a child? So uh, in those instances, however, um, the court, under judicial supervision, which is appropriate, because we are talking about the flow of money in, in exchange for a human being, 
um, there's there's appropriate court supervision. So you would actually go to the court and say, hey, judge, these are the expenses. We ask that you approve these expenses. And the judge, I, I've never seen a judge turn down those expense requests. So again, that's that's available in our, in our current so adoption law. Surrogacy, you could just go and say, hey, I wasn't able to work because I was a surrogate. I was pregnant. It was too hard on my body. I need my house paid for. I need my utilities paid for. I need this paid for. Because of this, I was not able to work to provide income for that. You could just then submit all your expenses for surrogacy to essentially get compensated probably the same amount, if not more, than what the current or like company would allow you. Well, I, you know, I, I've certainly never seen that in the adoption context as far as reimbursement for nine months worth of, of, um, of expenses like you're indicating. Well, in adoption, you're not pregnant for nine months with a child either. Well, the mother is. The mother's not, they just gave the child up, which is okay to just give up that child to someone. But I mean, I just don't understand how, like, you're so pro-adoption, biased towards adoption, but then yeah, you just want to go off the negative stories you've received from surrogacy instead of looking at the positives it can do to create families. Well, I, I, I'm, with all respect, I'm not doing that. I mean, I see the positive stories. And, and that's why we don't bring a prohibition against all surrogacy. We don't bring a prohibition against altruistic surrogacy. We're only talking about those surrogates, those surrogacies that are pursuant to a contract um, where the where the where money is exchanged and where in, in the adoption laws it would be a current it would be a felony. I mean, really, the, the reality is, if the if the courts enforce our adoption laws today pursuant to these surrogacy agreements, um, every paid surrogate mother would be felon would be a felon under the law. Um, because they're violating South Dakota law when it comes to termination of parental rights and when it comes to our adoption laws. And so that's, that's why we, we bring the bill, we prohibit the commercialization, and then we can do a summer study to look at you know every aspect. The summer study is not limited. So we have a deep conversation about um, what should be legal, should altruistic be legal, should it not be legal, if it's legal, how do you regulate it? Uh, all of those questions um, can be answered in the summer study. But if you're gonna do if you're going to pass this now and then do a summer study, why pass it now? Why not just do the summer right, study? Right, good question. Yeah, that is a good question. Uh, and the answer to that is because I'm prepared to say today that um, commercial contracts with the, which control the custody of human beings is wrong and should be prohibited. How many people in the state of South Dakota are using these commercial surrogacy programs? Uh, I don't know the the total number. I mean, the it's a it's a medical thing that's private, and then it's a sealed court order which is private. In fact, um, that sort of brings up an interesting point. Um, you know, you could you could probably go to the court and ask how many adoptions did you do in year A, and they'll tell you because they're coded, right? Because when a law is in place, um, when a law is in place, the court makes a code for it and then operates pursuant to that code. There's no code for surrogacy because the legislature has never legalized this practice. It's 100% unregulated. It's 100% unregulated. And Can I ask why you say it's unregulated? Because only 1% of people that apply to be a surrogate are accepted because it is such a high regulation from the surrogacy agencies that you're trying to prevent us from using in South Dakota. So, so, I, when I say regulation, I'm talking about government regulation, which we look to in, in all other areas of child custody. There's no government re regulation over the surrogacy. And now, the, there are brokerages who have enacted their own rules, their own internal rules, but they're not subject to any government regulation. Uh, let's, uh, we have a little, almost 15 minutes left, and I know there's some other subjects of interest. Uh, the gentleman in the back here has a question. Go ahead, sir. I have uh, another different medical question. I have uh, heard and worry about the demise of rural hospitals. I also uh, wonder why we feel very comfortable that our federal tax dollars are going to every other state and very few, like South Dakota, are not participating. And the real question is why are we not in the expanded Medicaid so that we have better health care, rural hospitals stay open. Uh, some of these places in South Dakota, as you mentioned, don't even have rural water and you know that would be places that would be helped for sure. You know, you bring up a very valid point. I guess one of the concerns that I have is that at some point, you all know where our federal de deficit is. It's it's really in a lot of trouble, yes. and and uh, we we just don't have a lot of a lot of extra money. Here's my fear: we agreed to Medicaid expansion, 
we get people really used to ha receiving those services, and then as South Dakotans, we can't pay for them anymore. You know, what happens to that? And uh, that's, a, that's a really huge concern, because at some point, we can't, we can't just depend on China to sign our, our bonds or our, all, of, all of the things, all of the debt that we have incurred. Um, I think we do a, a, the best job that we can at funding um, those that are our are weakest and are, need our, the most help that we can. I just really feel that we also need to protect our South Dakota way of life and our economy. And if we can't, if we can't sustain those programs, um, we hurt everyone. The deficit has climbed tremendously under our current administration. So it doesn't seem to be any restrictions on deficit at this point in time. The other question is that for a 90% federal compensation, 10% us, I suspect our health care costs would be lessened by more than the 10% it costs the state. It would be a savings to enact the uh, Medicare expansion. And that's that's one opinion. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not yeah. certain. <laughs> Yeah, uh, anyone else? No, uh, question there. Okay, yes, Mr. Trail. All right. Let me give you guys a reprieve and shift gears to one of your favorite topics, school funding. <laughs> so, perfect example of, uh, say, you guys support local control. Um, school funding is one of them. Uh, school districts, as see them as cities, creatures of the state. Uh, we are only allowed to do, for the most part, what the state allows us to do, funding is the, you know, the far end of the spectrum of that. Um, so I hope that it comes true that at the end of the, the legislative session that we walk away happy that the legislature holds up their end of the bargain that was made with the half penny sales tax for education and that we actually receive funding um, that is in current law uh, that the state should help uh, aid education. Um, the other issue is capital outlay. Uh, right now, there's three primary bills, and I just deleted the governor's one that was just filed at the last minute, um, that really only benefits T and SME. So to us, it's of no relevance. Um, but House Bill 1198 would allow the uh, school districts to have up to a $3, uh, up to $3 uh, per <coughs> the mill levy uh, for capital outlay funds. Del Rapids this year, we're like at 2.82. 2 we are declining every year under the current formula. So the difference between our current <coughs> funding that we receive in capital outlay and what it would be under 1198 is about $132,000, which in the state's budget is really insignificant. In Del Rapids, it's significant. That's, that's over two teachers' salaries. Now I say that coming out of the capital outlay fund because at least we have the flexibility to transfer funds out of that as well we're still building new we're remodeling you know, four million dollars we're putting into our facilities next this next year um, we're still able to do that and use some of that capital outlay funding uh, to pay for teachers um, so i would strongly encourage you guys uh, when that bill rolls through take a hard look at it because it has a significant impact on the district that you guys live in and overall represent um, that that's huge to del rapids we um, you know governor no has expressed her displeasure in student performance on testing in South Dakota schools. Testing, you can argue one way or the other. However, Del Rapids on that testing has excelled at all levels through all three of our buildings. Um, so we're an anomaly. We were just recognized, our elementary was just recognized as the Blue Ribbon School for the past performance over the last few years. We're doing something different in Del Rapids <clears throat> with the resources we have. So we're asking you, to continue to allow us to use those resources and not take them away, um, as current legislation just the legislation continues to do so and erodes at that ability. Um, instead of throwing us <laughs> in the lump sum with every other school district in the state, look at what we're doing and how we operate, um, and maybe there's some tools that can help other districts because uh, we function quite well. And and I'm not saying that as a school board member, it's because of the school board. I think it's testimony to the staff that we've been able to hire and keep in Del Rapids over the last several years. Um, and I want to make sure we can keep that rolling for our children's education, because that, of anything, is the best investment we can make. 
Let me just answer that, Jeff. I, I have had discussions um, with Spencer Josh, the prime sponsor of this bill, and with um, Bob Siddick and with Summer Schultz on this on this specific bill. And I do believe you're, everything you said is just correct. And I do plan on supporting the bill. So I, I mean, because we do need to put some discretion at the local school board and then be able to have them use those funds if necessary. So I do plan on supporting the bill. Just let you know that. Uh, yeah. Well, <coughs> I'll just step back a little bit and say that um, if I had it my way, we would follow the law and follow the funding formula and fund education up to, you know, what's supposed to be about 2% this year. And then um, from there, fill out the rest of state government. Um, that, that brings on some real hardship because now you're looking at um, state employees who aren't going to get a raise. And they work hard too. And Medicaid providers who are already operating at a loss to their business to provide these services to people who can't afford it. And we're gonna tell them, sorry, no ongoing increase for you. Um, but I will support the, the funding formula because that's South Dakota law. But we do need to remember that, um, you know, we, it's, we don't have, we're not the federal government. We balance our budget. And we don't have an unlimited amount of resources. And so when we make funding priorities, it's to the detriment of somebody else, you know. Um, it's to the detriment of, uh, of the highway patrol guy who's going out there with a, with a bulletproof vest on every day, you know. Or, you know, pick the state employee or, or Medicaid provider. So we just have to keep that in mind. These are not easy conversations to have. Um, it, it does come down to priorities. You know, I prioritize on the side of following the law that we have in place today. Um, I do think we have to, you know, sort of take a hard look at the funding formula because there's a lot of areas where it's just not working today. Um, so maybe that starts up that conversation a little bit. So uh, that's that's where I'm at on the budget generally. Yeah, I guess I would just add that uh, I do believe that Del Rapids is functioning well. I think all probably all of our school districts are functioning well in our particular district, but that is not the case statewide. I mean, we we hear some pretty pretty significant issues with with students and how they're learning and how they're doing you know interestingly we had as the Senate just went back and looked at some history one of the things you know when you talk about local control you have to remember that teacher salaries are set by the local school board and uh, one thing that is a bit concerning to me even though I love all of our administration and I think they do a good job in Del Rapids overall statewide even though we fund our teachers at the 47th percentile our administrators are funded at the 18th so there's a quite quite a bit of discrepancy there and you know I think when the school funding formula the the true story behind <coughs> it was meant for school consolidation you know we we have a lot of school districts in this state that maybe maybe we don't need that many I mean but that's very near and dear to people's hearts you know they don't want to lose their schools and that's really a tough 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 thing for us is to weigh those the pros and cons of that and so it, it is always a it is always a challenge and when you legislate and it's statewide we know what's going on in our local school districts but I also have talked to our local superintendents about and I've challenged them I said find a way for us to incentivize you to maybe combine some of your administrative staff I don't think there's any CEO in here that would have a superintendent for have a CEO at a Baltic location a Del Rapids location a Tri Valley location you know they would probably figure out a way to collaborate some of those services and so that we could actually trickle down some of those some of those monies to our teachers or our students or our curriculum but that's a tough conversation to have right because they're all of our friends they're our neighbors we we appreciate them all but so just know that everything is super super complex because we do also have CSPs that come to us and say we can't pay as much as the gas station does and what we do is so difficult we are you know we are doing major major health care we're we're changing diapers we're you know we're and, and so your heart breaks for them as well because they also do a great service for us or the chemist that, that we have as a state employee that says I can't continue to work for the state unless I get more money I, get, I need additional funds and so just know that 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 we do hear all the stories and we try to balance and we try to make it the best that we can but it's it, it, it's pretty challenging and some of the arguments both ways are, are very compelling Chris yeah I'll offer to buy you a cup of coffee next Saturday 
we can have this discussion. All right. Okay. I'll <laughs> share some history. I know there's lots of history. I know. I know. That, and, 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 and yes, yes. And I do appreciate all that history. Because he he it does. thinks he knows something about that. I mean, imagine that. I know. I can imagine that. And I will add, even though this is also a very dear friend of mine, you know, when you talk about that, the law, that 1.9 percent, we really take a... a we take a hard look at that, but we take a lot of hits on that. But what we don't get credit for is years that we go over the 3%, which is also breaking the law. So when our funding is better than it is, and it's happened, I've got the list of when it does, nobody says, you're breaking the law. You're giving us too much money. <laughs> so so just, just, keep, just keep that in mind and don't hate me later. <laughs> okay, we, we have uh, another question right here. Uh, staying on that topic, just trying to get more information about uh, where there's House Bill 1043, which is said to revise property tax levies and kind of looking at why those uh, tax property levies are set lower for, uh, it hasn't gone past appropriations yet, but trying to figure out what the justification or rationale is be behind lowering those uh, levies. Uh, for the upcoming year, potentially. I think Representative Pischke is pulling it up. I am not familiar with that at all. Keep in yeah. mind, if it's not in our chamber, yep. we yep. It's, it's, it's tough to follow. It's sitting in a press uh, right now. I think yeah. that, I think, and again, I, I'm speaking a little out of turn because I haven't read this, but what that looks like to me is every year, see, when we adjust the state aid to education, there's also an adjustment to the property tax levies uh, that goes along with that. And so I think, although I haven't read this closely, I think that's probably just the, like the annual adjustment to the property tax levies that goes along with, um, with the increase to, um, to education from the statewide level. So maybe they wrote it like this because the governor proposed a 0% increase. I'm not sure, but I think that's probably what we're looking at there. John, that is the color game we're going to okay. along with. Yep, so that's, what, that's what you're looking at. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Well, I know you guys would. Uh, one, one more question. One important question hasn't yeah. been addressed. Where, where is is this still the kids carrying guns still a viable thing in the legislature? Is that in the w where kids carrying guns? Yeah, where at one what? Where, um, if a child can carry a pistol as long as they have a note from their parents outside of what's currently okay, which is like ag use. We passed a bill um, unanimously out of the Senate a couple days ago, but it only addressed if a parent was with a minor child um, it, because the law had missed the last, uh, last year, I believe, when we passed it, had missed that part of it if they were out doing trap shooting or something that the child under 18 couldn't carry it. So we, we just redefined that, but the one you're talking about, I am not aware of. I, I don't know if it's a House bill that's filed or... Um, but but no, I haven't. Uh, One last question. Uh, tuition increases for students. I think it's probably going to come up. I'd like to know your position on it. You know, actually, I had a conversation with the Board of Regents, and they, they assured me that there was not going to be a tuition increase this year. So if I can hold them to that, that's what they, that's what they have told me. They've, they've done a good job of uh, making some cuts and revamping some things there, so I don't believe that there will be a tuition increase this year. Okay, well, we got all good things have to come to an end, and I guess uh, we've come to the end. Uh, first of all, uh, on behalf of the Del Rapids Lions Club and on behalf of the Del Rapids Chamber, we want to thank you for being here. We want to thank you for your, your respect and, and the way you, handle, you dealt with these questions. Who said life isn't complicated? And there's a lot of these issues which are very emotional. If you have never been out to peer during a legislative session, you should do it. And you just sit in on, on, a, on, a, on a committee hearing, probably more so the committee hearings, which are much more detailed and you hear uh, the pros and the cons. and you. Get a feeling for the fact that, yes, there are people for something, people against it. But you get to hear their issues and the questions that are asked. And, and in the big picture, the process tends to work. It's not perfect, but it's, it's a process. But you should, uh, if you have an opportunity to do that out of peer, it's worthwhile. We were out there the week before Municipal Day, and so we get to visit with the legislators and express the concerns of municipality. So, so again, we want to thank Senator Langer, Representative Hansen, Representative Piskey for being here. Uh, you know, I, I don't think they 
took these jobs because they thought it was a piece of cake. I, you know, and, and they're willing to come to this meeting today and listen to you guys grill them, you know, and I think you were real nice. You were real kind today. So, so again, we want to, let's give these guys a round of uh, appreciation. Thank you. Okay. And thank you to our mayor. He does a great job. He brought his whole staff, I mean, he brought it. Del Rapids is represented very well. As you can see, the, the rest of our communities probably don't like the fact that all three of us are from Del Rapids. But he does an excellent <laughs> job as mayor, um, and, and I thank appreciate you. what he does. That, that is also another thankless job, believe me. It's being on city council isn't a piece of cake either. So, so yeah. I appreciate that. And I'll do a little selfless plug. I do have my petitions up here if anybody would like to sign up. So. <laughs> thank you. Thank and, you for being and, here. And one last thing that uh, this was recorded by uh, Big Sioux Media and Matt. This will be posted out on Big Sioux Media. So if there was something, if you want to sit through this again, you can do that. <laughs> okay. Thank you again. And uh, have some more coffee or more pizza. Thank you.